Well, hello and welcome to Summit. Thanks so much for joining us in worship today. We are so glad to be able to gather together with you. Yes, and wherever you're joining us from, whether you're on your couch at home, you're at one of our park mm. churches or house churches, welcome. And if you're new today, a special welcome to you. We'd love to know that you're out there. We'd love to connect with you. Uh, below your screen is a Get Connected button. You can just click that, uh, pass over some information. We'd love to follow up with you and see if there's anything we can do uh, to answer questions about the church. If you're in one of our other channels, you can find that button in your description. Yeah, a special shout out to our Soto friends today. Hello, it's yes. good to see you. Uh, well, Dan, you head up our connect group yes. here. Yeah, and gathering together is such a vital part mm -hmm. of what we do as a church. It's what God calls us to you. And, and you really have put a lot of time and thought and energy into how do we do that together. And there's some exciting stuff coming up I'd love for you to share with our folks about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in general, get into a connect group. Mm -hmm. Our connect groups are uh, just opportunities for you to gather with eight to 12 people in Christ-centered relationship. And we think that's important because this this is a connected world. We all feel connected mm. right now, but there's something really different about having accountable relationships, about showing up each week in a group environment, sharing what's going on, sharing our prayer requests, and then coming back and doing it the next week to kind of create a rhythm of community. And so for everybody out there, uh, join a connect group if you're not currently in one. A special connect group that we have is called Starting Point, and this is an eight-week group uh, that meets intentionally in order to answer questions and doubts about faith. So if you're somebody that's like, man, I'm not sure what I think about this church thing yet, I'm not sure about this, and I'm logging in online, I'm checking everything out, or I used to go to church a long time ago, but I'm not sure about entering back in, Starting Point might be the right environment for you. This is a great environment where you can come with all your questions and, and, and it's a safe place to have them answered. It's a real small group environment. No questions are off limit. No doubts are off limit. There's no expectations of you. It's just really eight weeks walking through discussions. And so your questions can be like, what about the dinosaurs? Your questions can be something a little more deeper than that. Like maybe I'm starting to think that I believe, but what is me saying yes to this say I'm saying about my non-believing mother, brother, sister? And so these are real questions that people come to the church with and often the church is doesn't feel like a safe place to ask questions or even have doubts about your faith. You kind of falsely believe everybody's got it all together, but the reality is we're all here trying to work it out. And so we create this intentional environment called Starting Point. Uh, we have a group that's beginning uh, at the end of the month, and we'd love for you to sign up for it. You can find that information on our website, but just reach out and hear a little bit more about it if any of what I just said sounds like it's right for you. Absolutely, and relationships, again, are just so important. Mm -hmm. It's who we're wired. And one of the most unique relationships a lot of folks here at church live in, including myself, is in marriage. Yeah. And our marriages are so important. And taking time together is so important, especially in the midst of the seasons that we've been through uh, as we move through life. And so oh. here at Summit, we're creating some intentional space to do that. And we actually have a really fun and exciting yeah. event coming up that, Dan, I want you to share a little bit yeah, about. Yeah, I'm really excited about this. On February 6th, we're doing a marriage and rich date night. There may or may not be some fun games led Could by be some our very own OJ out here. It might be a little minute to win it to play there. Who knows? Uh, but don't be scared if you're like, I don't want to come to something and you're going to pull me up on stage. No. You just come, enjoy a really awesome night out as a married couple. And while you're here, we'll, we'll feed you both physically. There'll be some food available to you. Um, but also we want to feed you with information for you to start to internalize and think about and say, hey, how are we doing as a couple? How is our marriage yeah. doing? And that might feel like a really scary thing to you. And I just want you to know this marriage and rich date night is meant to be a fun, lighthearted yes. night that, that maybe does lead you to like, what would be our next step as a married couple? Should I join a group around this yeah. that we'll be launching later in the month? Um, should we just start to open a conversation? And that's just really important in the season because we have to check in on our marriage. We have to go and do intentional work in order to keep it healthy. And that's what's gonna make us thrive into the future. So wherever you are in your marriage, I want you to know that Marriage and Rich Date Night is going to be a fun night to kind of hang out with us and some others on staff. Uh, and, and just, it's just going to be a good night out. Yeah, Rachel and I are super excited. Yeah. February 6th, come join us. More information below. Well, we're going to continue with our worship in a couple of ways this morning. Uh, we're going to continue. We're going to sing some songs and hymns to God. We're also going to continue with our teaching. Uh, today we are in week two of our series, God at the Heart, and Kaylee Newkirk is going to be joining us. And if you didn't get a chance to listen to last week, I would highly encourage you to go back mm -hmm. and listen about God the Father and God the Son, how we are taking a look at the Trinity and how God exists in three persons as one and the mystery that's there, but also the beauty that's there. And today 
We're gonna be focused on the Holy Spirit. I am so excited that you're gonna get a chance to hear her and, and to be able to learn more about this really important member of the Trinity. Uh, we're also gonna continue with our worship this morning by the giving of our tithes and our offerings. And if you're new or visiting again, super glad you're here. Please don't feel any obligation to give. We do hope the service would be a gift to you. But if you're a partner here at Summit, if you're a follower of Jesus, there's a good chance you know why we give. We give out of obedience to scripture. We give because God has entrusted his resources to us. We have this amazing opportunity to leverage those for his work here in our church and our local community and around the world. There's a number of different ways you can participate in giving. The number is populated on the screen. The text to give, you can click below as well. But right now, we'd invite you to continue in your worship, to, to worship our God who exists in three persons in one, to worship God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit today. Supreme judge of the earth chooses for thine the weak and the poor, to frail earth and vessels, the things of no worth, and trusting thy good, which ever endures. Those vessels soon fail, though full of thy light at thy decree. Broken and gone, and brightly he appeared, the truth in his might, as through the clouds, the lightning shone. All honor and praise, dominion and might, to God three in one, eternally be, around us hath shed. Marvelous light called us from darkness to glory to see honor and praise be to our God. The sound will go forth in Christ Jesus the Lord. And Satan doth fear, citadels fall As with the trumpets, and forth that thy word and One long blast shattered the Canaanite wall Oh, loud be the trump, stirring its sound To rouse us, O oh Lord, from slumber of sin Thou was kindled, darkness around May they illumine our spirits within All honor and praise, dominion and might To God three in one, eternally be Around this hat shed, this marvelous light Called us from darkness Glory to see like clouds we are born to do thy great will, swift as the wind about the world go. Of creation, there 
at the start for the beginning of time With no point of reference He spoke to the dark Fleshed out the wonder of the light And as you speak
We are in our series, God at the Heart, where we learn what is God like at his heart? What does it mean that he lives in my heart? And this series, by the way, it really builds on itself. So if you haven't seen week one yet, please go back and watch that. If you're watching this on video, you can pause me. I won't know that you skipped this week to go watch last week. So just go do it. Uh, I really think it will enrich your experience as this series builds on itself to understand more about the Trinity, uh, first God the Father and God the Son, and then the Holy Spirit, what, which we will look at today. In our first week, we learned about those more famous members of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and we learned why God created us because there was so much love. God the Father so enjoyed and delighted in loving his son eternally, his eternal son, that they created us so there would be more people to experience that love. And we learned that, that man sinned by deciding to love ourselves and our own desires and ambition more than our loving God. And so then God sends us the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, in the flesh so that we could see what true love looked like his sacrificial death on the cross to pay our debt. And when we see him there, there is this chance, there's a chance to be snapped out of our self-obsessed love and to, and to instead look and see the beauty of our loving, life-giving God and redirect our love. And the spirit, as we previewed last week, is the one who enables us to see the beauty of Christ. We, we receive Jesus as the spirit enables us. And so as promised this week, we're gonna to begin to chase that spirit from the Old Testament this week into the New Testament next week. And if you're new to this whole church thing and you're just not, you're like, I don't wanna get sucked into this. Listen, I get it. There's a lot of bad intel out there about God um, and, and my hope for you in this series is that you would be able to experience God, to, to see God, to understand God as he really is, not as how we make him in our culture, not as how, not how our, our, our flawed parents have represented him to us, and not as, as we ourselves make him decide he must be based on our lived experiences. You know, life is incredibly hard and uncertain. And I, and I think that understanding God as he truly is, while it doesn't always take away that pain, it does give it meaning and, and makes our assurance certain. And it gives us hope, you know, it gives us hope that, that these hardships are in fact incredibly temporary. And so that's, that's what I want for you, you know, just lean in and listen. And I want you to try to experience that God. That's the God I want you to find, the God of hope, the one that gives us hope, you know, even in this apparent trilogy of 2020 that we seem to be living now. So uh, to that end, let's pray. Jesus, Thank you that you chose to come and be with us, to rescue us, despite the fact that we didn't deserve it, despite the fact that we did not earn it. You loved us so much that you wanted to be with us forever, even if it cost you your life. Lord, we have so many flawed ideas of who you are, what you want from us. 
Lord, would you replace those with the truth? Would you help us today to get a glimpse of who you are, who your character is, even in this shy third member of the Trinity? Help us understand you better so that we can better experience your love, so that we can better be shaped into the people you created us to be as your image bearers. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Spirit of God in the Old Testament, the Ruach Elohim. I want you to try to say that word with me, Ruach. Ready, you try. Ruach, you gotta kinda clear your throat at the end. The Spirit of God is mysterious. And there's also a lot of bad intel about him out there. You know, people think that the Spirit is not in the Old Testament, super wrong. They think uh, the, the Spirit in the Old Testament's a force and in the New Testament he's a person. Nope, he's a person the whole time. Uh, or we think that, you know, the Spirit only gives us these, these kind of powers, uh, these endowments, these special powers through intense spiritual experiences. Also super duper wrong. We gotta right the ship on this because there's a lot of bad, bad information out there. So I have picked just three things that I have, th there's so much that I've learned uh, in my research um, on this series. I wish I could share it all with you, but I can't. So um, I'm just picking these three things because these are things that have enriched my relationship with God um, over these last few weeks. So this isn't just information to me. This is this has helped. This helped me better experience God. And that's my hope for you is that this won't be just information to you, but it, it will inspire you, that you will literally be inspirited by understanding God better. So the three things are that I picked for our time uh, that we have is one, the spirit reveals reality to us as it really exists, not as we would have it. I think I mentioned this last week. Two, the spirit's inspiration comes to us through preparation, not instead of it. This is a big one. And then last, the spirit is always at work to restore order from chaos. So let us meet that spirit. Before we get to the points, let's meet the spirit. I want you to look with me at Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. By the way, the Hebrew for that formless and empty is it's, it's tohu vavohu, wild and waste. I love that. Whew, I love that. Tohu vavohu, wild and waste. What's to My car is tohu vavohu on the inside. Uncreated matter is tohu vavohu, uninhabitable, wild waste. I'm actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this passage, uh, Genesis 1, 1 and 2, with uh, some of the words more literally translated from the Hebrew. So you can just listen, you don't have to read it in the NIV or whatever we have. In the beginning, God created the sky and the land. Now the earth was wild and waste. Obscurity was over the surface of the chaotic waters and we're about to meet the spirit here and the Ruach of God was hovering over. The Ruach of God, the Ruach, the spirit here in Hebrew is the word Ruach. And in the Old Testament, this word Ruach appears more than almost any other word that we think is important. Just to give you some scale, Sabbath 111 times, Torah, 223, Shalom, 237, Berit, this covenant, 287, Ruach, 387 times in Hebrew, and then another 11 in Aramaic, Aramaic and, and Ruach is just everywhere, and for good reason. In the Old Testament, God's Ruach is all over the place. He does a lot of things. They, when they're wandering in the desert, the Israelites are wandering in the desert, according to Haggai and Isaiah, the Ruach, the Spirit of God is who leads them in the cloud and pillar and, and who stands between them to guard them from the Egyptian army. Also the Ruach of God, the Ruach Elohim blows in the quail from the, the sea so that they have meat to eat. That's the same word, Ruach, that blows in the quail, the same word that is used uh, of the spirit that brings order and life to creation in Genesis 1. What else does the Ruach do? The Ruach rushes upon people like Gideon, Samson, the judges, Balaam, he's not even an Israelite, spirit makes his donkey talk. The Ruach rests upon people like King David, it's passed on from people like from Moses to the elders, Elijah to Elisha. Ruach is poured out in Jeremiah. Ruach fills people like Daniel and Joseph who we're gonna talk a lot about today. And Ruach cleanses us in, in Psalm 51. So there's like, there's like 400 references to the Ruach doing something in the Hebrew Bible. He's all over. So why don't we know that? We don't know that because 
when the Hebrew was translated into Greek and then eventually into English, the translators made a choice to break up this word, ruach, into four different words. And those words are breath, wind, spirit with a little s, and spirit with a big S when it's the Ruach Elohim, the, the spirit of God. Fun fact, Holy Spirit, the word Holy Spirit, only used twice in the whole Hebrew Bible. It's used once in, in uh, Psalm 51 and Isaiah 63. So, okay, uh, that'll be interesting to five of you. So that's all context. Now we can get on to the sermon. Wish I was kidding. <laughs> to keep it simple, we're just gonna look at one character in the Old Testament and see how they interact with the Spirit of God, not all 400 references that I mentioned above. Uh, we're gonna look at a man named Joseph. And I, ha I have so much B-roll for this sermon series. I wanted to talk to you about Daniel and Ezekiel and Jephthah. Ever hear of Jephthah? We're gonna hear a little bit about him. But, but it's just too much, it's too many people. We gotta narrow it down. So we're gonna stick with Joseph. I think it helps most people know him. Uh, from the Bible, if you're not at all familiar with him or familiar with the Bible, his story is really easy to follow. So let's take a look at the spirit of God in Joseph. Quick summary of his life before we read our passage. Joseph had been gifted with the ability to interpret dreams. So when he's a kid, uh, he, he starts dreaming these dreams. His dad, Jacob, loved him more than all of his 11 brothers, uh, and they hated him for that. Not because of the dream thing. Um, his dad didn't love him more because of the dream thing. His dad loved him more because uh, his, his mom was his dad's favorite wife. It's a, whole, it's a whole thing. You can read it in Genesis. So Joseph is a kid. He dreamt uh, these dreams, and one of the dreams he dreams is that his older brothers, all of his relatives are going to bow down to him. And uh, so he shares that with him and they already hate him. So as a result of him sharing this, they decide to sell him to slavery. Well, first they decide to kill him and then it ends up, they just sell him into slavery into Egypt. As, re as a result, they tell their dad he's been eaten by a wild animal. So Joseph is sold by his brothers to an Egyptian named Potiphar. And Potiphar puts him in charge of all of his stuff. He makes him his regent, his caretaker. Uh, and and uh, he gets really good at this. Joseph is very good at it until Potiphar's wife falsely accuses him of assault. And so Joseph is thrown into prison. But even there, he continues his practice. He continues to interpret dreams. The Ruach is still with him, even in prison. And he continues to practice uh, this skill set of administration. In fact, they put him in charge of the whole jail. So he's kind of running the place now. Fast forward about 13 years of jail, and slavery. And then one day Pharaoh, who is the ruler of all of Egypt, Pharaoh, uh, starts having these very disturbing dreams. He dreams that there's these scrawny wheat plants that swallow up these seven really healthy wheat plants and that there's these seven scrawny sickly cows and they swallow up these sleek, these seven sleek fat cows. And none of Pharaoh's wise men can interpret the dream. No, no one knows what to make of it until his cupbearer, one of his servants says, hey, I, I know a guy. I know a guy, I met, you know, I met him back in the joint. We did time together down in Goshen. I don't think he said it that way. So, so Pharaoh brings Joseph to the palace, tells him his dreams. And now Joseph is about to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. So this is our passage today. We are in Genesis 41, chapter 41, beginning in verse 28. Joseph says, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that this matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. So the spirit of God is said to be in Joseph and he dreams dreams. He dreams dreams that, that reveal reality to him in a way that other people cannot see or, or, or choose not to see. I mean, his brothers, they didn't want to bow down to him. And so they rejected the reality that he revealed to them. They rejected it, even though every bit of it would come true. They just, they didn't want to hear it. And people do this all the time. You know, pe people don't always like bad news. We don't always like bad news when it comes to us. Sometimes we don't want to hear it, even if it's true, even if it's true. This is a human thing. In his book, A Theory of Cognitive Dissonance, Dr. Leon Festinger argues that the human brain is always looking for an internal consistency of beliefs. Otherwise we will go crazy. So, so in other words, it, it basically, if we have two competing facts, you know, we have evidence for A, but there's also evidence for B, the human brain will just 
pick one, the one that they like better, and they'll just stick to it really, really tightly. I'm just gonna believe A, even if there's a lot of evidence for B, even if the evidence for B outweighs the evidence for A, because we cannot live in this state of competing beliefs, cognitive dissonance. And people do this all the time. You know, this is, this is how tobacco companies were able to convince smokers that cigarettes didn't cause cancer for, for decades, you know? It's, it's, it's why those, those poor people who end up on American Idol auditions and they're so, so bad, right? They're so bad. Nobody, and they, and they don't know it. No one told them. They genuinely don't know it. Nobody kind of wakes up and says, I think I'm gonna go on national television so I can become a meme. You know, nobody wants that. So, so you know, little, little Jerry, he, he wanted to believe that he was a good singer. And, and, and there wasn't a whole lot of evidence of it. You know, people never paid him to sing. People don't ask him to sing. His brother tells him he's the worst. But his mom told him, baby, you're a natural. You have a gift. And so now little Jerry has to pick which he's gonna believe. What does he do? He picks the one that he wants to believe. A, that I'm a good singer, even though there is ample evidence to the contrary. We do this, I do this, you do this. Sometimes we are shown reality and we just don't like it, so we reject it. There's a, there's a passage in 1 Kings that I think sums up this uh, sentiment so perfectly, and you don't have to pay any attention to the names or the whatever, just, just it's an anecdote. Think of it like that. I don't wanna confuse us with more Old Testament people, but just listen, because it's I think it's funny. So in, in 1 Kings 22, there's um, the, the king of Israel is trying to convince this other king, Jehoshaphat, to go invade another kingdom. And uh, all of his wise men and seers and all the people are like, yes, go. God says he's going to deliver it into your hands. You should go. Be victorious. And uh, Jehoshaphat says, okay, but shouldn't we ask God? Is there like, isn't there a prophet we can ask? And, and this, is, this is the king of Israel's response. I think this is so funny. The king of Israel answered Jehoshaphat, there is still one prophet through whom we can inquire of the Lord but I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. That's his actual words in the Bible. He has a prophet who is willing to give him a preview of the future from God Almighty, but he don't want to talk to him because he just prophesies bad stuff about me. Wah. I mean, this is, so, this is so human. We're the worst. We don't want to hear it. We'd rather ignore reality than to face a reality that we don't like. But the thing is, it, it doesn't help us. It hurts us. It hurts us, it hurts other people. You know, f facing the reality of cancer is hard, but if I don't face it, it's gonna kill me a lot faster. Even when the, the, the truth is hard, it is still life giving. It gives us a chance. You know, facing the reality that you have a problem with alcohol, that's very hard, but not as hard as facing the reality of a divorce or facing the reality of adult children who you are estranged from or facing the reality of a liver transplant or facing the reality of a, of a car crash that takes someone's life. Reality as it is, facing it is life giving, even when it's hard. If we see it, if we'll accept it. So the spirit of God re reveals reality as it really is, not just as we hope it will be or wish it was now. And Pharaoh could have rejected it. He could have rejected it because it was scary. He could have gotten a second opinion. Maybe some of the, you know, the king of Israel's seers could have told him what he wanted to hear, but he didn't because he was wise enough to realize that ignoring the truth or rejecting the truth and replacing it with a lie cannot actually change the reality. Denying the cancer doesn't cure it. Denying the addiction does not set me free. There is life-giving potential offered when the Spirit of God reveals reality as it truly is. So second thing the Spirit does, the Spirit brings inspiration through preparation, not instead of it. And I think this one is so important. I think we get this idea that the Spirit is super opposed to hard work. Like, like for example, if a preacher were to be working very hard on one single sermon, and her spouse says, hey, why don't you leave some room for the Holy Spirit? As though the Holy Spirit is opposed to hard work, that he only speaks spontaneously, never speaks through hard work. This is all hypothetical, you know? And, and, and sometimes, sometimes he does do spontaneous things. I mean, absolutely, you wanna talk about Pentecost, right? The Spirit is poured out and these people start speaking languages that they never studied. Yes, those were languages they didn't study, but what were they saying in those languages? The Old Testament, which they absolutely studied, 
They were talking about the wonderful, mighty works of God in history. So, so you know, the, certainly the there are spontaneous gifts of the Spirit, but that doesn't mean that preparation isn't also necessary. I mean, they weren't reciting the the plot of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. They were saying the mighty works of God. So the Spirit has given Joseph this dream uh, interpretation, this ability to interpret dreams, but that's not all he shares with Pharaoh. This is important. So verse 33, come back with me here. He goes on after he interprets the dream, he says, and now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land and take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming up and store the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man? One in whom is the spirit of God. What do you think the word is there? The Ruach, the Ruach Elohim. Can we find anyone like this man in whom is the Ruach of God? And this is important, this timing, this timing is important. Joseph has already interpreted the dream, right? That's, that's kind of what we would think of the more mystical part. He's already interpreted, he's done the mysticism, but then he just adds on some administrative advice. This is just like leadership advice he's giving about how to survive a food shortage. And that didn't show up in the dream. That is wisdom. The wisdom that Joseph has been cultivating since he was 17 years old. You know, he's 17 and he was gifted with the ability to interpret dreams, but he had not yet developed the skill set of wisdom. He had the ability to interpret dreams, but he was not yet skilled in wisdom. Case in point, why, why Joseph? Why are you telling your brothers who already hate you? Why are you telling them about your dream where they all bow down to you? I mean, read the room, little Joey. This is not, this is not wisdom. This is, this is giftedness in the presence of immaturity due to inexperience. So he was gifted with revelation, not yet skilled in wisdom. That, that, that bit about storing up a fifth of the grain every year, he didn't dream that. That's not spontaneous revelation, that's wisdom. Knowledge and experience applied. Knowledge and experience hard won over years, 13 years of, of serving in a jail where he was a prisoner and serving a master as his slave. Dr. Levson writes, the exceptional quality of Ruach Elohim in Joseph is the product of lifelong discipline rather than a sudden influx of the spirit that gifts him with extraordinary abilities. This sort of inspired doggedness is what fuels prophetic conviction. It demands quiet commitment for the long haul, daily discipline and receptiveness to God's alternative vision for the world. So first thing, the spirit of God reveals reality as it truly is, not as we want it. Second thing, the Spirit's inspiration comes to us through preparation. Joseph was prepared for this moment. His inspiration came at the crossroads of hard work and giftedness. Now, parenthetically, the, the, the Spirit does on occasion give what we would call giftedness. You know, that he's, he's naturally gifted at the piano or something like that. But even the gifts, even the gifts must be honed and practiced and developed into, into the Ruach Chokmah, the spirit of wisdom. We give people way too much credit for giftedness and charisma. I think we mistake charisma for the spirit of God as though that's all the spirit is. You know, people, people can be gifted beyond their level of obedience. Joseph could have just been gifted. He could have just stayed a dreamer, but instead he worked to become a strategist too. We can be led far off, far off, from where God wants us to be when we follow someone who's gifted but disobedient. Gifted but unprepared, that is dangerous. You know, we think we are hearing the voice of God through a, a, a charismatic speaker who's telling us something that we desperately want to be true. Like, if I give God my tithe, he's going to give me a Lamborghini. Like, we want to believe that. But it's not true. How do we know? We, well, 
1 John 4, test the spirits. We're supposed to test the spirits to make sure they're from God. How do we test? Well, we know that the spirit reveals reality as it truly is, not as I would have it. And we know that the spirit gives us inspiration through preparation. And so what do we know? We know that if something is just tickling our ears or if it doesn't line up with the whole word of God through careful study, rigorous honesty in its interpretation, then that truth that they're selling you is suspect. Test the spirits. We're supposed to. It's a discipline. I know it is because it's way, way easier for us to just believe the things that we want to be true, especially, especially when they are said to us persuasively. We've got to test the spirits. So the spirit reveals reality as it truly is. The spirit inspires through preparation. And finally, the spirit is always at work to restore order from chaos. Verse 39. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all the people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Joseph in these two verses has just become a very big deal. And that's huge because you fast forward another, what, nine, 10 years, almost a decade of, of working for Pharaoh. Joseph is working for Pharaoh. Everything is going exactly as he predicted it would. Uh, the, the famine has arrived and, and Egypt is not starving because they have this stockpile of grain. But what, other regions are starving. Regions like where? Hebron, where Joseph's family lives, his brothers, his dad, they're starving. And so the, the brothers here, there's, there's grain in Egypt. And so they send some of them to go buy it. And I hate to like yada yada through some of the juicier plot points, but like truth be told, they reconcile. And uh, Joseph says, it's me. And then he gives them grain and, and, and they live. He saves his family from the brink of starvation. And it is through Joseph's saved family that the Messiah eventually will be born. That's so important. What's my point here? The spirit is always at work to restore order from chaos. And Joseph's whole story has come to be out of chaos. His story came to be because his brother sold him into slavery. His story came to be because a lady tried to seduce him and then accused him of rape. His story came to be because he got thrown in prison and had to serve there. His story came to be because of this deadly famine that was about to descend. This was not God's plan A for his people in creation. When we sinned, the good ordered garden went wild. When we sinned, we turned the good ordered garden back into tohu vavohu, wild and waste, disorder, Chaos, hard to grow food from, subject to natural disaster and famine. Sin brought the chaos back into creation. And the spirit of God, the Ruach Elohim, is working through Joseph and through, and through the judges, through the kings, through the prophets, all the people that we couldn't talk about today. He is working to sort out this mess, through them to sort out this mess, to restore order to the good creation but more than that, when we sinned, it, it, send, it wasn't just creation that went wild. It was us. It was us. Our hearts, untethered from the goodness of God, became wild and waste again. Tohu vavohu isn't just around us. It is in us. And the Ruach Elohim is working, always working to restore order to that chaos, not just the chaos of creation, but the chaos of the human heart. That's what Jesus came to do. There is chaos, violent, wild waste in my heart. I am untethered from God in my sin, and he makes a way for us to reconnect through his spirit, which Christ breathed into me with his final breath. That empty feeling that you have in the pit of your stomach, that fear that things will never be better, that inability to enjoy good things, that sickening feeling that you are just so bad that you don't even deserve good things if you could enjoy them. You don't have to live with that. You don't have to live 
with wild and waste in your heart anymore. The Holy Spirit is your tether and he is there right now waiting to connect you to Christ, to the source of all goodness, the source of all satisfaction. The reason I wanted us to understand at the beginning that the Ruach isn't just the spirit, but also the wind and the breath is because I think that is so hopeful. Spirit, wind, breath, all of these are reminders that God is present all around us. No matter how far you have wandered, no matter what sins you are running from or running toward, God is after you. He's after you right now. Take a breath, take in a big breath. That's his breath, his borrowed breath, his ruach that's keeping you alive so that you have one more moment, one more day to embrace relationship with him. Close your eyes, feel the wind. If you're outside, feel the wind around you. That's the ruach rushing by. The ruach, that's God's wind. And you don't need a mystical experience to experience this, to access this. Feel the wind, take a breath, and know these are reminders that he is so very near. Take a breath, feel the wind, open up his word, and you will find him everywhere, rushing to and fro, filling people, being poured out on people, surprising people, empowering people to, to, to clean up the chaos that we've created. And he's there and he's waiting for you to say yes so that he can come into your heart and breathe life back into the chaos. Let's pray. Jesus, we need you so very badly. You know every single person who is listening today. You know the parts of their heart that have gone wild. You know the parts that are terrifying to live in, the wild and waste, the uninhabitable. You know what went wrong in us, Lord, and you know what we need. You know that we can't get there on our own you know that we would be stuck in that wilderness forever without you. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for coming for us to take us where we could not go alone. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that tethers us to you, to the possibility of relationship with you. Lord, help us say yes to it. Help us take a deep breath and remember that you are there waiting for us, loving us, waiting to guide us home. Lord, I pray that we would have courage to lay down at your feet everything that separates us from moving toward you. Lord, we, wait, we lay down our wild and waste and we ask that you would fill us with your Ruach Elohim, that you would be so very near to us and show us in increasing measure the love that you have through your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name, amen. You give life, you are love, you 
We are so very glad that you joined us and brought the church into the rooms where you're sitting today. If this video has been helpful to you, we would ask that you go ahead and share that. You can share it on social media. You can tag us if you'd like to. Um, also, if there's anything that we can pray for you, with you about, please let us know. There's a link below. Click on it, and we'd love to get to know you more uh, and, and be, be with you and invite the Spirit to be in our midst together. For everyone, please hear these words of benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, go in God's peace. The service is ended. <laughs>